a bit by bit, I've got quite a few songs in the can. You know, I've got a whole other album's worth of material, at least, in the can. But, you know, uh, it was I was able to take advantage of, of, uh, of, of folks' uh, availability, you know. Mm-hmm. We, we, we've got... Um, We've got uh, uh, the late great Marty Salmon's playing on Cold Comfort. Yeah. We were able to get him just for a little brief period of time when he wasn't on tour with Buddy Guy, you know, and, and he wasn't busy. He's like, come on down to the studio, lay some tracks down, you know, and then we've got uh, Daryl Coote, the same thing with him, get him in the studio, you know, lay some tracks down. And all the cats on the album, we just, you know, we've got, uh, we've got some fantastic players. <laughs> Hey everybody, Mike Jeffers, ChicagoJazz.com and BluesInChicago.com and welcome to another episode of Around Town. Today we are talking with blues master Nigel Mack. He has got a brand new recording out and he's going to be doing a brand new recording CD release. I guess it's a record release. I guess it's a recording release party because who knows what everybody gets things on digital and vinyl and everything else, which is all good stuff. But anyways, that's happening July 9th. 9 p.m. at Buddy Guy's Legends, right there in the South Loop. Of course, 700 South Wabash, BuddyGuy.com. And Nigel Mack, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking a few minutes, and congratulations on the new recording. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's great to have a new album out. I'm going to say album. That's just what, basically, the way I look at the, the whole situation. I know, you know, there's so many different ways we can go with it, but I, I am happy that albums are starting to come back. The vinyl is starting to come back because... You had the CDs, and now that sort of is fading to one side. Now the albums are coming back, and of course you have digital downloads and all that. But it doesn't matter because the playing's incredible on the recording, and that's what we really want to talk about here. So you've got 12 new tunes on this recording. Of course, anybody that knows Nigel, he plays constantly. He tours constantly. He's all over the place. After the pandemic stopped him for a little while, he's hit the road. He's back at it pretty hard. Of course, he's playing around Chicago, too. But you put this recording together. Let's talk a little bit about putting it together and coming up with the tunes on this recording. And of course, who's on the recording. So first question to you, how did the recording come about? Because I know you, you're playing a ton. Did it come about because all of a sudden everything sort of stopped? And did you think about putting things together during the pandemic? You had a little downtime or was this something in progress and just kind of, kind of uh, made a natural recording out of all the different things that you've been doing? Well, there's the our various stages we'd be doing recording with with my good friend Michael Freeman, who uh, many people might know won the Grammy uh, for uh, for Pine Top Perkins and Willie Big Eye uh, Smith's uh, last recording. As a matter of fact, they won that Grammy award. So, uh, and he's done a lot of work with with Mississippi Heat over the years. You know, done a producing just a ton a ton of stuff, and he's a great guy. So little by little, we've been working together and putting songs together. You know, I come in with an idea. We get we get we call up some cats. We put everything together. And uh, and so then you know by a, over the period of time I've I've got quite a few quite a few songs together. We were recording out at the old wall to wall studios, which sadly uh, was demolished to make way for condominiums of all things. <laughs> so yeah, so it's a uh, it was it was sad to see that was a great place. It had it had red shag carpet everywhere. It was a real trip. It was a, a really uh, a fabled you know Chicago Chicago studio. So. So we had a we had a bunch of songs together, and I I I went through all the songs and I found them, and uh, and then uh, then I got a hold of my of my old engineer, uh, my my mixing engineer in Nashville, that's uh, Commodore Perry Barrett, and so you know he took everything and put him in his box, you know his computer, and made the magic happen, put everything together. Along the way, we had uh, we we did some uh, some uh, recording. Uh, I, I got backtracks a little bit. We did some overdubs at Rax Track Studios and uh, Rick Barnes and the crew were opened up the studio for us. And so, uh, so that was awesome. So we were able to get some really cool stuff. Uh, you know, they got a real Hammond B3 organ there. They've got great old analog gear. So we were able to make a bunch of stuff happen, you know, and then, <laughs> and then we gave everything to, to... Hey, real, real fast though. I mean, cause I'm curious because, you know, the process and all that, and we'll, we'll get into that, but I know you, wrote all these tunes these are all original compositions right and right. knowing that you don't just write 12 tunes and they automatically go on the recording i mean how many tunes do you have sitting around that that you had to go through and kind of figure out what's going to make sense for this recording because listen to the recording you know it's it's not your chicago blues shuffle i mean there's a lot of there's r&b sounds there's the blues sounds there's a mm -hmm. it's it's kind of like the nigel mack sound right when you go and see nigel play live so 
how did you sift through all these tunes and all these compositions that you wrote to decide which ones go on the recording, which was going to sound really good thematically on the recording? It was a lot of work, a lot of sitting down, uh, you know, with Rick, and because we did a lot of combing through the stuff with Rick Barnes to saw to see what song would thematically work, yeah, and uh, and getting stuff together, and then saying, yeah, we're going to pursue this one as opposed to whether we're going to pursue that one. Because I've got, you know, over the years, I've, you know, a bit by bit, I've got quite a few songs in the can. You know, I've got a whole other album's worth of material, at least, in the can. But, you know, uh, it was, I was able to take advantage of of, uh, of, of folks' uh, availability, you know. Mm-hmm. We, we've got, um, we've got uh, uh, the late, great Marty Salmon's playing on Cold Comfort. Yeah. We were able to get him just for a little brief period of time when he wasn't on tour with Buddy Guy, you know, and, and he wasn't busy. He's was like, come on out of the studio, lay some tracks down, you know. And then we've got uh, Daryl Coote, the same thing with him, get him in the studio, you know, lay some tracks down. And all the cats on the album were just, you know, we got uh, we got some fantastic players. And so it was, uh, and then, you know, of course, the, then the pandemic hit and everything got stalled out for a couple of years. And, you know, we were able to, it was, it, that was, that was uh, you know, able to go through and go back at stuff a little bit more and come back out of the second time and do some more overdubs and make sure everything was right. So did, did you have a lot of the recording already done and then the pandemic hit and then that let you get maybe some fresh ears on it? And you actually sat with it a little bit longer than you might not have. And maybe that even added to the recording, right? Yeah, we the, the stuff was pretty much all in the can, like right up to the minute the pandemic, we were recording right up and also the pandemic shut everything down. And so we weren't really, you know, able to go into and, and be with, with other musicians for quite a while you know, really do what we normally do. And so we just were able to do a few overdubs here and a few overdubs there. And then, you know, mixing, a lot of the mixing was done, you know, remotely, so to speak. And then, you know, we had to, we, you know, we had to send it over to my, to my friend, uh, Mike with Jason, and he cleaned up a bunch of stuff and have, you know, did some editing on it as well. So it was very much a, a, a long, quite a long process to get to where we are right now. And hopefully it all sounds like it was supposed to be you know, like, like that, you know what I mean? That's the whole idea. Right. So, well, it's, I mean, it sounds great. And, and, and on your, uh, on your recording uh, or on your, on your kind of like your bio thing for the recording, you talk about how, you know, you're a composer, arranger, obviously harmonica player, guitarist, vocalist, compo- you know, all of that, but also you take a lot of stock in producing this recording and all the recordings so that it sounds really crisp and clean. And that's where Michael Freeman comes in and all these other guys that you're working with. Um, what's the process with that? Why does it mean so much for you to make, make it just, you know, cause you, you know, some people just get together, they all play together in the same room and they record it and they come out with a good recording, but I really like the fact that I'm listening to yours. Uh, although I didn't do a deep dive, I did listen to it and it, you can hear every little nuance in that recording, which, which I really like because I can really get inside the music at least. And especially since it's your compositions, you're, the words jump out. I can hear the story as you're doing. It. Is that sort of the reason why you take so much stock and really making sure it's produced when you put something out? I, I take I take a lot of stock in having and having friends who have really really good ears. <laughs> you know, <laughs> besides me, you know, Commodore Barrett down there in Nashville. You know, he can hear amazingly. You know, amazing stuff that you know that would pass me by. And as a matter of fact, it was his idea to put the first song on the record, Travel and Heavy, to make it the first song on the record. He said, this song is really coming up nicely because when they mix, when you mix stuff, it sometimes changes direction, mm. you know, as, or as you record stuff, it, it changes direction, you know. And so then you go, uh, you'll, you'll follow that direction and, and wherever that might take you. And so when somebody has an, has a, you know, a, uh, an idea, you know, maybe we should put the song here, put the song here. I, I tend to give that a lot of, you know, a lot of gravity, so to speak, you know. Well, and especially when you're putting something out like this, and if somebody buys an album, they're going to listen from top to bottom. You know, now, mm-hmm. you know, obviously, with digital downloads, you might pick that tune, that tune, that tune, which is great. That's great. And hopefully that encourages people to then go download the whole recording because you really put this together. So it starts from the top and finishes mm-hmm. at the end. And it's a it's kind of a story all the way through it. It's an experience, right? Right. Well, the, 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 the song begins with, with traveling heavy and then, and then we go, then we go for a drive, you know, down the highway 69, which is a straight up Chicago blues shuffle, you know? And so then, you know, there's, there's sort of that moving, uh, I guess, uh, what's the word theme to the, to the whole album, you know, and then there's, then we they come across a song. There's a, there's a, a, um, a song in the album which is an instrumental song a little tune i could should call called redemption 
you know, and that's and that's taken you know, all the people who are like you know have to do all these things in their life, trying to get redemption for the things that they've done wrong, or you know, trying to achieve nirvana or whatever. You know, and then there's a song that you know, like uh, one of my biggest influences, and and I don't think he really gets enough credit is uh, the late great uh, harmonica master James Cotton. You know, he did a lot. He did so much great stuff, and when I saw him uh, at the Winnipeg Folk Festival, I think it was like 1979, 80. It changed my life because I saw a band that could go and stylistically move from from doing an R and B song to a stone cold blues song, you know, to some funky stuff, and and it gave me this tremendous artistic license, uh, you know, along with Taj Mahal. You know, some people used to say, "Well, what are you a harmonica player? Are you a guitar player?" And I looked at Taj Mahal and said, "Well, he just does it all, right? I should be able. To, why, why can't I? You know." And well, so, yeah. so but back to the writing of the aspect of the of the. So I just go wherever I feel that that muse is taking me, and I follow it down that path. And then, you know, me. Hopefully, it'll fit on the album. If it didn't fit on the album, then it was it was put in the cam for maybe the next album. You know. Well, the beauty of it too is that you play so much that you can whip those out. So if somebody comes and hears you play, you'll play the tunes on the recording, but then you probably have another 50 tunes that you can play to fill up the rest of the sets because it's, you have so much recorded material already, plus the stuff that you're talking about in the can talk a little bit about, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, uh, I should make sure I mention this right now again, July 9th, 9 PM Sunday, the record release party over there at buddy guys, of course, right. South Wabash Avenue. I encourage everybody to get tickets, buddyguy.com. Who's in the band? Because we talked before we came on today and you've got a killer band and it's the full band. And some of some people might not have seen you with the full band. They see a buddy guys in different places with a smaller style. Mm-hmm. But this is the big band. So why don't you talk a little bit about it? Well, on my recordings, I love I love horns. I was brought up with a, with a father who was a jazz, a jazz fanatic. And so I grew up listening to horns. And uh, so then we so we have we have uh, James, Jamo Wilson on drums, and he's been touring with me, playing with me uh a lot and uh, then we also have daryl wright who's also been the same thing uh, he's on bass at bass master and he helped write a couple that he's actually got some writing credits in the song and then we've got my longtime guitar player uh a partner jr wider on, on guitar and he's just he's a masterful he's a wonderful player he's got he's as deep as a river and then, uh, then we've got uh, daryl coots on keyboards uh, from the from everybody knows him from the ronnie baker brooks band and so we've known each other for a long time and just, just love his playing. He's, he's a fantastic player. And then Lee's Jilly on saxophone, who also is a writing credit and also wrote uh, all the charts for the, for the horns for the last two albums. And then we have Philip Perkins on the trumpet. And so he just, you know, he, I think he just played the Chicago blues, uh, blues festival with, with Ronnie or Wayne Baker Brooks. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we're talking some, some really deep stuff here as far as players go. Well, and the thing that I, I like about that and listening to the recording, as I mentioned before, you hear the R&B, those horn tracks on that recording, just because they're not on every single track, but when you when you when they're on there, all of a sudden it just, it changes the vibe, but it brings everything together in a different way. It's really a good listen from top to bottom, but hearing it live is just completely different than listening to it on the recording. So that's why it's so important for people to go check out Buddy Guys July 9th at 9 p.m., Sunday, by the way, and buddyguy.com to get tickets. And of course, nigelmack.com to pick up the recording. Let's talk a little bit about your background, just for those that don't know it. We don't have to go, because you and I could talk for about five hours about your background, because it's <laughs> unbelievable. But the thing that fascinates me is because you, you grew up in uh, Saskatoon, right, Canada. That's right, yeah. That's like sort of in the middle western part of Canada. And you wouldn't think that you would be so into music growing up there, but I know your father was a huge jazz fan. I never realized all the different groups that came through that town because mm-hmm. it's a college there, right? Is that right? Is that yeah, correct? it's a it's got a it's a big university town, and it's got a, it's also got a technical college or two, and uh, you know there's a river, nice a beautiful river running through it. Joni Mitchell's from Saskatoon, as a matter of fact. So. Okay, so there you go. So it's a very musical, artistic t- uh, city. It's about you know two hundred and something thousand. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it's got sort of a bit of a small town vibe, a small city vibe as well. And then it being right on a major uh, uh, highway between, between, uh, you know, Winnipeg and, and Edmonton, Alberta, and then out to Vancouver, you know, all the bands that were touring, you know, would always be going through Saskatoon, 
you know, so we we went saw we saw Count Basie, we saw uh, Muddy Waters, Stevie Ray Vaughan, you know, everybody that, that was touring played Saskatoon, and so we got to see them. And and then you ended up moving over to Vancouver, and is that how you ended up meeting, uh, kind of connecting with Chicago blues, and how you ended up coming to Chicago was when you were in Vancouver for the most part. So basically, the, the, there's so many uh, blues artists that were touring. You know, Chicago blues artists were touring on the prairies you know, in the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s, because they were able to get these week-long gigs, these big, you know, they were able to play six nights in one place. And so, you know, uh, I was able to, I got, I got a gig hosting Saturday afternoon jam session at the local uh, uh, blues bar in Saskatoon. And then I was, I, I got to meet Eddie Shaw and Sugar Blue and all these cats like that. They were all playing there for, you know, uh, Carlos Johnson's other one, six nights. And so we get to hang out with these cats and, you know, get everybody would get to know each other really, really well. And then when I moved to Vancouver, the same thing was happening. You know, uh, bands are coming to Vancouver and playing. And so really got to know everybody that way. How did you, so you came to Chicago because uh, somebody invited you to play a Chicago Blues Fest and you never left, right? I mean, that was kind of the, the, the capper, wasn't it? Well, I did go home afterwards. I was I was living in Vancouver and the, the late uh, Professor Eddie Lusk invited me to come play with his band. And then he passed away and the folks who ran the River West Club where we were, where they were calling me up saying, hey, you want to move to Chicago and, you know, take over the professor's role, so to speak. But I was, I was playing and I was recording in Vancouver and I had a, you know, a hot band. I couldn't leave just yet. But so then, uh, but that, you know, the, the, that introduction got me rolling in the States. And, uh, you know, I started touring the States, you know, twice a year and we were on the road, you know, 250 nights a year for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then one thing led to another. And so in 2001, I was playing at Buddy Guys with my band and I met a young lady. And so uh, she was either going to move to Vancouver or I was going to move to Chicago. And it just seemed like a natural thing for a blues man to do is move to Chicago. So, you know, it seems as like I had the chance once before. And so I took the opportunity and I moved in uh, 2003. And then uh, six months, I always, I always like to joke that, you know, so I moved to Chicago for a woman in the blues. And then six months later, uh, she decided that she didn't want to do it anymore. So so I moved to a Chicago for a woman in the blues. And then six months later, all I had was the blues. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story. You can't make that stuff up. No, but that's a classic blues story, right? I mean, there, there you go, right there. <laughs> there. There it is. Talk a little bit before we get back to your the and and wrap this up, but I'd be remiss because I you know I just got done doing a lot of uh, interviews at the Blues Fest and talking mm -hmm. to blues musicians from all over the country. Um, talk a little bit about since you've toured all over the country, including all over the world, really. I mean, you've been all over the place, but I know you were doing so much in Canada and the U.S. What is it about the Chicago blues, not the scene, but the sound? I mean, what because it's just unique to any other region really and when i was talking to different artists you know they bring up the electric side and stuff but there was kind of like a a deeper deeper kind of a soulful sound in chicago that it, it, it you had to have the blues to sing the blues from the older guys that i talked to i mean what 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 do you think that chicago just what is it about the chicago blues sound what well, is real i mean there's nothing you go to other places in the world and stuff sort of imported you know, Chicago blues grew up in Chicago. This is the birthplace of electric blues yeah. in the world, pretty much. And, uh, you know, this is where Muddy Waters, uh, you know, where it was refined was really in Chicago and the musicianship in Chicago, you know, coming up with all the, the folks who play, also played uh, soul and gospel as well. And, you know, everything coming together to make that Chicago sound, that hard hitting, you know, so it's got a deep, a deep groove to it, hard hitting yeah. groove, you know. And there's a lot of... Uh, they would call you know like hits in the music where you know the accents and a certain on a certain place and you go other places and artists you know they great musicians but they just don't have that language that the chicago players have to themselves and that's what brings people from all over the world to chicago you know from europe from japan from israel come to chicago to to to, to tap into that sound so because it's worldwide it's known as the chicago sound yeah, exactly. Well, that, that's a great way to say it too. The Chicago blues is real. And that's, you know, and 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 it comes from the soul. And 
to tie it back to your recording, your recording comes from the soul and I love the sound of it. And I, you know, when you listen to this and you see Nigel, by the way, anybody that hasn't seen Nigel perform, you need to go see Nigel perform because I don't know how he does more than one set because he's just tearing it up up there. He's got a ton of energy he brings to the stage and of course his entire band. So check that out July 9th at Buddy Guys, 9 p.m. Sunday night, Buddy Guys Legend, 700 South Wabash Avenue, buddyguy.com. And of course, go pick up the new recording and all the other recordings. I would suggest you just get your credit card out and just put <laughs> all of Nigel's recordings so you can get up to speed before you go see him at Buddy Guys. NigelMac.com. Nigel, thank you so much, buddy. I, it was good to see you, and uh, congratulations on the new recording. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, you know, people go to the website. I've got all the recordings are available. They just got to click on the big – there's a big uh, album cover on the on the website. They can just click right there, and it'll take you right to where you can pick them up. You can also get them on all the – usual digital download uh, channels and all that sort of stuff, all the digital platforms as well. But if you want to get a real CD, I'll even sign it. I signed the CDs for everybody, send them off to everybody. So it's a great thing. You know, those of us uh, that, that appreciate stuff that is actual physically owning something, like I'm, I'm that guy. I like to own stuff. You know what I mean? I like to be able to reach on the shelf and pull it out and go and look at the liner notes and, you know, all the, all the, the albums that I treasure, be there, be they whatever format, you know, cassette, vinyl, uh, or CD, and it's my prediction that CDs are going to make a comeback too. In 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 because the the young folks are going to discover CDs and go, oh my god, these things sound so much better than than cassettes. <laughs> well, that was a, that was the thing. You know, I couldn't believe it when we were doing some merchandise stuff right at the Blues Fest. They, you know, the the vinyls were really. This was six seven years ago, I think, is the last time we did we did stuff. But vinyls were going, CDs obviously, but the cassettes were coming back. All of a sudden people were buying cassettes. So it all comes back around. I mean, you know, everybody comes back around. But to your point, you know, the people that sign those those recordings, yourself included, people like to hang on to that. It's more yeah. than a recording at that point. It's a personalized memento and that's that's why they should go see you live so that they can yeah. take them home with you with them. Yeah. For sure. We also we also now have T-shirts. We've got T-shirts available now. We just got came out with some T-shirts. And uh, we've also got beer cozies as well, or koozies, however you want to say. So, Well, you, you could get all decked out there at Buddy Guys, 9 p.m. You can get a shirt, get a CD, get a beer koozie, head on out. All right, so 9 p.m. Sunday, July 9th, nigelmack.com. Congratulations, and uh, thanks for being on the show today, Nigel. Thanks for having me, Mike. Great seeing you. For sure. And, of course, thanks, everybody, for watching. And as yes. I always say, all the information is at bluesinchicago.com, chicagojazz.com. And until next time, hopefully I will see somebody out on the scene.